With the primary in the rearview mirror, Ohioans can look forward to voting again in just over 200 days. Though there is a special election in the 6th Congressional District in June to replace Republican Bill Johnson, who's now the president at Youngstown State University over the protests of student groups, some high-profile alumni, and faculty. Last week, my State House News Bureau colleague Joe Engel spoke with Lorain County Board of Elections Director Paul Adams, a Democrat and the incoming leader of the Ohio Association of Elections Officials, about voting data, especially on election night. This week, she talked with the Republican in charge of the state's elections in all 88 counties, Secretary of State Frank LaRose. On election night, we were watching the results come in um, on the Secretary of State's website. Mm -hmm. And uh, national networks called the race before we even started seeing numbers really coming in. Um, what do they know that we don't know? Well, I think a lot of times that's a result of exit polling that they do. They, they'll ask people as they walk out of their polling location to voluntarily disclose who they voted for. Of course, the voter can tell them none of your business and walk on past. But uh, I think that a lot of times it's based on that. I'm not a big fan of that, by the way. I mean, we work really hard to get those results first accurately, but also quickly. We'll never sacrifice accuracy for speed, but we also work very quickly. So you see results at 7.45, 8 o'clock, 8.30 on election night. Those are all those early votes and absentee votes, which are intuitively already there at the Board of Elections, ready to count, ready to release. And so we get those out quickly by 8.30, 9 o'clock we're releasing those election day numbers. And, and so Ohioans um, get those numbers very quickly. You can make a determination about whether those numbers are conclusive or not on your own. I know members of the media do that. We usually are at about 90% by 11. 90% uh, of those votes have been tabulated and released. It usually takes us uh, until two or three in the morning to get that final 10%. Those are where maybe they, they had to uh, run the count again because of an error made by the Board of Elections or, or whatever else. And so it, it goes until the wee hours for us, but we don't go to bed on election night, neither do our boards of elections, until 100% of the ballots that are in that day, so excluding provisionals or the absentees that are still coming in, maybe from overseas military, but everything that we have on election day gets reported on election night. We're proud of that. So local boards of elections, though, they have the outcomes at the precincts and they post them on the doors or the windows. They bring the ballots to the county boards of elections where they're counted again. Um, why aren't those precinct totals immediately reflected to, on the Secretary of State's website? Well, that's something that we'll be able to start doing in the future. One of the things that we were able to get done working with the legislature, working with a group called the America First Policy Institute is a thing called the Data Act, which is gonna make Ohio uh, really once again a leader in the nation with the transparency of our election data. Uh, right now, those numbers tend to get aggregated at the County Board of Elections, and then we report them out in aggregate uh, but we'll be able to start reporting at a much more granular level once the Data Act is fully implemented, which is something that we're looking forward to. And so when's that going to happen? Well, I think the effective date is uh, late this year, although we're working to bring some of that online in advance of the November election. It won't be fully implemented. There are a lot of technological changes that we need to make to get that done. And again, we're never going to sacrifice uh, accuracy for speed, so we're going to work through that very diligently, but we're required to have it all in place, I think, by the end of this year, or early part of next year. And that would take those precinct totals and get them into the count faster so people could see it? Not faster. only that, but a lot of other more granular data about how elections work. I've always said that there's nothing to hide at a board of elections. It's an open book. Uh, we uh, collect a lot of different pieces of data. Sometimes the only way to access that right now is by doing a public records request at a board of elections. That can be an 88 county process. In some cases, we even have to request it from the Board of Elections. There's no sort of streamlined, automated way for us to get that more granular data. With the Data Act in place, we're going to have um, not only for the sort of power users like uh, journalists and academics, people that are sort of data scientists that, that want to uh, get into this, but also for the average person to be able to get more information about how elections work. And part of this is telling the story of really how accurate and honest Ohio's elections are. Unfortunately, there are people that believe a lot of things that just aren't true about elections, various conspiracies or, or whatever else. And so being able to open the books and show um, more of the, the granular data about about how elections work will also give you the opportunity to do an apples to apples comparison of different counties and, and that kind of thing as well.
There's some data that should be available uh, on election night early from the early vote. You know, for example, we should know, you know, maybe partisan makeup of those who voted early, uh, maybe genders of people who voted early, ages of people who voted early. That kind of data should be available. Why don't we get that early? Well, we don't gather demographic data about voters. So when you register to vote, uh, you know, we, we, we know your date of birth, so I guess we could, we could get that. Uh, but we don't have gender or race or, or a variety of other things like that. We get your name, your address, your, your date of birth, and, and that's effectively it. Your state driver's license number or the last four of your social, your signature. Those are the things that we get when we register someone to vote. So there's only so much data that we have available on the demographics of the individuals in question. And remember, uh, we know who voted, uh, but we don't know how they voted, right? Which right. is the secrecy of the ballot that we, we require and, 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 and want to have. And so, uh, you know, a lot of that gets depersonalized in the process of, of tabulating those results because we just get sort of the aggregate numbers. Um, and uh, we'll never be able to track how individuals vote. That's not something that we want. That's why, for example, your absentee ballot goes in a secrecy envelope. So even the elections officials that are tabulating that are not able to know how each individual voted. We know some people uh, question the integrity yeah. of an election. And when they see those uh, declarations coming out from national networks so early in the evening, um, and they haven't seen totals that reflect that, it kind of feeds that that whole mentality of, hey, there's something wrong here. Mm -hmm. You've got to admit that, right? Well, I, I, this is why I've told you that I, I'm not a big fan of that, but they are predictions, right? The, the freedom of the press, there's a reason why your profession is protected by the First Amendment. Uh, they can predict if they want to. They do that even before Election Day when they conduct polls and, and they, they, they predict which way uh, an election is going to go. An early vote call like that, an early call by a, by a network or by a group of reporters to say, hey, this person is the winner, it's just that. It's a prediction. It really doesn't matter until we get the final numbers out there, which, as you know, don't really come until three weeks after the election when we conduct the official canvas and those final totals, which are about to come out here in the state of Ohio. The final official total is the one that really matters. Election night is just people racing to be the first one uh, to call a race in, in many cases. But there's also an important number that we started reporting uh, when I became Secretary of State, and that's kind of the denominator. Uh, we put on our website how many outstanding absentee ballots there are. So on election night, you'll know, uh, if you look on our website, how many could still change, right, over the, the, the ensuing three weeks with provisional ballots, with um, outstanding absentees that are still expected to come in, that kind of thing. And so if your favorite candidate won by 100,000 votes and there's only 80,000 outstanding ballots, well, you know it's over. But if your favorite candidate won by 10,000 votes and there are 80,000 outstanding, well, that's still too close to call and, and those could change in the, in the final three weeks of, of the official canvas. So just a, a piece of data that we want to make sure that people are aware of. Every election, we see local boards of elections doing things differently, mm -hmm. okay? Um, we have 88 boards of elections in Ohio. Is that a problem? I mean, I know you have, you have training, and they're all supposed to go through the same training, yet they do things differently. Yep. Um, what about that? It's both a feature and a glitch, uh, or a feature and a bug, if you will. I mean, it's the way that Ohio runs elections is very decentralized. And what that means is that our 88 counties are pretty autonomous in how they operate. Uh, each county board of elections is run by two Republicans and two Democrats. Uh, they are appointed by me with the advice of the county Republican Party or the county Democratic Party. And that's why, by the way, when you see your ballot, uh, the signatures of those Board of Elections members are on every ballot. Same reason an artist signs her painting or his painting is, you know, same reason why the Board of Elections members' signatures are on the ballot, because they're the ones responsible for the conduct of elections within the law of the state and the standards that I put out. So the state law dictates what we do, of course, in the state constitution, uh, as well as the, the rules that, that, that my office puts in place. But then within that, there's room for variation for each county to, to do things administratively the way that, that fits them. Uh, again, as much as I love being Ohio's chief elections officer, I don't really run elections. It's run by 88 counties 
and their local leaders under my supervision. And, and, and that's uh, one of the reasons why things work different in uh, very small counties versus very large counties. We try to standardize that as much as possible, but there's room for variation in that. What's the status of the no labels group? I know they wanted to be a third party. Where does that stand right now? Yeah, so they gathered signatures. Um, there were uh, a shortage of signatures in a few counties. Uh, we've asked a few counties to, to take a second look at that to make sure that they followed the law uh, appropriately. You know, these things often end up in litigation, although we try to avoid that, that kind of litigation. The, the sort of rush to the courthouse right before election day is a bad thing for elections administrators, for voters, for the confidence that people have in the process. So we're working with a few of the county boards of elections to make sure that they did the count accurately. And uh, once that's done, they will certify that result to me and we'll be able to announce whether they were able to meet the threshold uh, of, of qualifying as what's called a minor party in Ohio. There's the major parties, Democrat and Republican, and then Ohio's law allows for the establishment of minor parties. You think of the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, this new group that wants to form. They have the right to do that if they're able to gather enough signatures and, and uh, we'll let you know whether they, they were able to meet that threshold or not very soon. Okay. Um, Ohio left the Electronic Registration Information Center, yeah. known as ERIC, mm -hmm. uh, left that over a year ago as several Republican-run states had also done that. Um, you praised ERIC at one point as one of the best fraud-fighting tools that we have, mm -hmm. yet Ohio left ERIC. Uh, because leadership didn't, uh, because leadership of Eric didn't implement certain changes yep. that you wanted. Um, the Eric database helped you find around 100 incidents of suspected non citizens voting. So, what has replaced Eric and has that new system helped you identify instances of suspected voter fraud? So, I have a duty to the voters and the taxpayers of Ohio to make sure that if we're spending money on something, if we're working with something, that it's actually fulfilling its purpose. And Eric started out well over a decade ago as a collaboration of states for sharing data, publicly available data in most cases, but sharing data to make sure that, for example, if someone registered to vote in another state, that we could then cancel their registration or begin the process of canceling their registration here. Or if someone tried to commit the form of election fraud of multi-state voting, if they tried to vote in Ohio and vote in, a, in another state, we could catch them doing that. I've referred several hundred, actually, to law enforcement uh, that we've caught doing that. The problem with Eric is that over time it had become very unaccountable. And um, I actually had a member of my team join the executive board to try to bring about a whole list of reforms. And it wasn't just me, it was other secretaries of state around the country that had the same concerns. We asked them to do data transparency uh, audits, uh, data integrity audits, they refused. We asked them to do financial audits, they refused. Uh, we tried to get them to remove a, a, a couple of pretty harsh partisans that had uh, ex officio board seats uh, and at the same time we're going on cable news programs and trashing one party exclusively and not the other party and that was concerning this group should be kind of above that that kind of thing uh, when after a year of trying to reform Eric the group uh, refused those those really pretty common sense reforms then myself and some other secretaries said okay we're not going to be part of an organization that is increasing its cost every year, right? We have to pay to be a member of that, um, but refusing these, these kind of basic transparency reforms that we had asked for. And what we've done is replaced it with something much more streamlined, which is a state-to-state uh, data sharing arrangement that we have now with several other states where we've just entered into a memorandum of understanding where after the election we can make our data available to them, they can make their data available to us, we can do a simple match to see, for example, if there, if there are multiple people with the same first, middle, and last name that voted in our state and in that state and the same date of birth. It's not proof positive. I guess it's statistically possible that there's someone with the same first, middle, last name, and date of birth in both states, but at least it gives us the starting off point to do further investigation to find out if that is a multi-state voter so that we can refer them for prosecution. We can just do that on a state-to-state -state basis without having this sort of costly and unaccountable third party.